What do you make of the action and what's inexpensive now, if anything? So we have very expensive markets here, but this is a liquidity driven rally, which means it can go on for a while. And the U.S. has not yet seen the full impact of those three rate cuts last year because it takes about 12 months. So win their way through the system. So we're pretty positive on the year. Having said that, there are going to be some hiccups along the year, not least of which is the election, and not least of which is our new trade deal, which c contains within it the seeds of, of some uncertainty going down the road. So are you looking for a uh, intra-year drop? And if so, by how much? So we're looking for, we think there could be an intra-year drop for about 10%. I mean, a typical year is about 14%, so that wouldn't be unusual. Having said that, when you have such a huge year, like you have had last year up almost 30 percent, including dividends, then you usually have a very positive year following. And we had a fiscal boost and a monetary boost last year. That's working into this year's earnings. Brent, what do you think of markets at these levels? Yeah, I, I agree in large part. I mean, I think you had three uh, kind of headwinds to the markets for the past year and a half. They were one, uh, the Fed, which was tightening, as your prior guest mentioned. Uh, and now they're easing, and so that should begin filtering through the system. And there's no chance, in my estimation, given the election, the back and forth between the Fed and the president, that they actually hike in 2020. You had the trade war, which I think the president has what he needs to take the electorate right now, and I think he'll dampen it given it's election year. And number three, investors, unfortunately, over the past year and a half have been building cash up. I think now, as those recession fears ebb, that is fuel for the fire of the market to go higher. And as long as bond yields remain behaved, I think the stock market moves higher. You just mentioned, Alicia, uncertainties around trade. What are they? So the really interesting thing about this trade deal are the purchases, the $200 billion in incremental purchases. So that's not really free trade, right? That's sort of managed economy. But it's so much of a higher boost than what we had last year or even the level of 2017. It's going to be very hard for China to achieve those levels. And now the U.S. has a mechanism by which it can then dispute it with China. And if there's no satisfaction, the U.S. can raise tariffs again. So we've actually encoded the ability in law to raise tariffs again. I just think it's going to be very hard to achieve those $200 billion in, le in the level. And, and I would imagine that some of those commodity purchase for, purchases, for example, are going to come from maybe sales we would have made to our other trading partners to go to China, which you would imagine potentially bid up prices. That's right. It's, um, it's not entirely additive to the levels that we already have, although yeah. it is a win. It's definitely but a win. But I think when you take that and you couple that with, say, wage pressures, and we're hearing this idea of margin compression due to how low unemployment is in this country, you've got to wonder what that means for the economy and the potential for it to run hot, and thus what the Fed does. Right. So that's one of our smaller risks for this year. So we think that there is a chance that inflation raises its head in the next 12 to 18 months. And it sounds like a crazy thing to say. It's a small risk. But the Fed has said they're going to sit on their hands and they're going to let the economy run and run hot. And they want it. And I think even if you see a 2.5 percent inflation rate, two five. even if you see it, the Fed could sit. So that sets us up. We have a tight labor market. We have a labor force participation rate, which is pretty good. The prime age participation rate is very good. Think about where we're going here. And firms can't find workers. I mean, that's what small businesses tell us. They can't find workers. We're set up. If all goes well, doesn't mean it will, but if all goes well, we're set up here to see some sort of rise in inflation here. Well, you got copper today, Brent, at the highest since May. Palladium, I know it's a little arcane, but you got to go back three years uh, to see prices like that. I mean, what's to say that uh, produce, I mean, protein, uh, and then eventually labor is not far behind? That is a risk. So inflation, actually, the coreish measures of inflation, while all this talk about deflation and lack of inflation, the coreish measures of inflation, such as trim mean PCE, Atlanta Fed sticky CPI, they have actually been rising over the past year, not falling. And so while market expectations and market indicators have come down, there is a disconnect there that may have to be rectified somewhat later in the year. But I think, as Alicia mentioned, the most important thing that I can tell you and the most important thing I've been saying for the past three to four years is the Fed doesn't care anymore. The Fed has completely shifted from being what it was, an inflation fighter, a cycle ender, a disciplined market participant, to now being one where they're an inflation enhancer, a cycle enhancer, and they actually don't want the market to go down. They listen to the market. The Fed's economic outlook will be met this year, and yet rather than hiking twice, they lowered rates three times. And so this is a well, big shift in the Fed that we've seen yep. over the past year.
that that would make sense unless uh, Dallas is Kaplan, for example, now talking more overtly about the risk to the rise in the balance sheet, that it's not free, right, that there's the danger of it creating imbalances. And if that view gets spread across the committee, who knows? That's right. Well, look, we've learned that central banks are really good at inflating asset prices. They're not, it turns out, they're not actually so good at raising inflation. And this could be the mechanism by which we get some inflation. Look, there's a risk here. If all of the rally and all of the sentiment is due to increase on the balance sheet, what are these central banks supposed to do? I don't know how we get out of this. You know, smarter heads than I need to figure this out. But, you know, this is central. You know, the Fed is endogenous to the stock market action. You can't separate the two.